Good afternoon, everyone. We're almost at the noon uh, hour. Let's uh, give one more minute for everybody else to join us in case they're waiting until that uh, magical time. Hope everybody's enjoying what looks like here in Colorado, an actual spring day. We were debating whether or not snow was in our forecast last week, but we're actually getting some sunshine and some warmth. If you are joining us from outside of Colorado, let us know in the chat. And if you're even joining us from Colorado, let us know in the chat. All right, we're at the noon hour. Hope everybody's having a good Friday. I'm Rob Shore, I'm your host. I'm a zoologist with the Colorado Natural Heritage Program. And uh, thank you for joining us. We have a really fun day of um, topics that I get really excited about because the presenter today and I do a lot of work in this realm of conservation and management. So I'm pretty excited for everybody else to get engaged with uh, this, this topic. I'm gonna share my screen hopefully, and uh, let everybody um, peruse the beautiful scenery of fall in Colorado as I take you through um, who the Colorado Natural Heritage Program is. The Colorado Natural Heritage Program started in the 70s or so as the main institution for understanding where rare and lesser known species are in Colorado. We were birthed out of the same process uh, that the Nature Conservancy developed for identifying where the last great places were uh, throughout a host of areas in North America. That uh, program within the Nature Conservancy has since then expanded greatly. It's now managed through the Nature Serve and um, it expands into all the provinces, uh, all the US states and into a host of South and Central American countries. So um, our mission, as you can see at the top, is, is that we're really providing information for the management of these species. And it's even expanded beyond species and even beyond rare or lesser known species in some cases, providing an assortment of data on uh, where wetlands are and the conditions of those. And to even species like Jeremy Seamers, our presenter is gonna talk about today, bats that may be rare because we just haven't been able to collect information on them well, or they could be common, but they have been an understudied group. So um, with that, uh, before I introduce Jeremy, um, I'm going to take you through our land acknowledgement statement. And that is, um, Colorado State University acknowledges with respect that the land CSU is on is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations and peoples. The area of CSU was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for numerous other native tribes. We recognize the indigenous peoples as original stewards of this land and all the relatives within it. As these words of acknowledgement are spoken and heard, the ties nations have to their traditional homelands are renewed and reaffirmed. CSU is founded as a land grant institution and we accept that our mission must encompass access to education and inclusion and significantly that our founding came at a dire cost to native nations and peoples whose land this university was built upon. This acknowledgement is the education and inclusion we must practice in recognizing our institutional history, responsibility, and commitment. All right, you've heard enough from me. Our presenter today, let me stop sharing my screen. Our presenter today, um, I have known since I started here at the Colorado Natural Heritage Program in 1997. We both started in the same year and we have collaborated on a host of bat conservation oriented projects. Jeremy Seamers is the lead zoologist and zoological director at Colorado Natural Heritage Program. He studied occupancy. He's done mine and cave inventories. He's done forest ecology studies on bats. He has helped understand population ecology of bats in Colorado but the breadth of his zoological focus has extended from birds to mammals, to amphibians, to reptiles. He is, as many of us in the zoology section are, a jack of all trades. And so today we get to um, embrace a group of species that I'm particularly affectionate for, these little guys, and I'm sure you've seen Stella Luna before. 
is that we get to talk about our work at the Colorado Natural Heritage Program on bats and bat conservation. So, Jeremy, ready to take it away? All right, yep, thanks Rob. I will share my screen. That look good? Okay, thanks. So yeah, as uh, Rob introduced, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, let's get ta started talking about um, bats and what CNHP is doing uh, in terms of helping conserving these species. So today I wanna to take you through um, a, a few topics that really could be an hour long talk or plenty or an entire class in and of themselves. Um, and so I already know I'm not doing them justice, but uh, we'll take you through some quick, uh, quick flashes of um, information on these different topics and different species. Um, and so that we can talk about a little bit of what CNHP is doing. So I wanna talk about the bats of Colorado, just a brief introduction uh, to a couple of the species and the major groups, and then look at some emergent threats uh, that are um, threatening bats right now. Um, something I'm calling the Western Dilemma, which uh, we'll look at in a little bit. Um, you'll just have to wait and see what that is. Um, and then approaches that CNHP is taking to address uh, conservation information needs, and then also future directions that we will be moving toward. Um, I also do wanna make this as interactive as humanly possible, as virtually possible. Uh, and so if you would like to uh, fire in a question, Rob's gonna be manning the chat and the hand raising um, and he'll interrupt me as it's appropriate. Um, and then we can chat in the middle of this, this if need be. So feel free to, to ask questions in the chat, but there also will be some time at the end to, to have some question and answer. Um, so the work I'm presenting today is not work of just myself. There's a lot of folks at CNHP who work bat on bats. Um, and this is um, CNHP Bat Cauldron, um, Andrea Schumann, Beth Stevenson, uh, Rob Shore, and Justin Unrein. Um, and so a lot of this work uh, is a collaboration with them uh, and couldn't be done without them. So bats of Colorado, um, there's 19 species of bats in the state. And for the purposes of this talk, uh, one important thing to note is that we have both migrators and we have hibernators. So the overwintering strategy of um, these different bat species varies. Um, some of them will migrate, some of them will hibernate, hibernate and some of them do a little of both. Um, we do not have any federal threatened or endangered species within the state. Um, and so there's no um, US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, threatened and endangered species uh, that are prompting any actions on species within Colorado. Uh, so initial threats to bats when I started working on them uh, included things like roost disturbance, uh, whether it be accidental or intentional. Um, and then also uh, some threats related to forest treatments and potentially how those treatments might be affecting bats and their roosting. Um, other disturbances to caves or mines where bats might be roosting. Um, and those were some of the primary threats that we were, we were concerned with. Um, but uh, as we have worked on these for a little bit longer. Um, there are these things that are uh, considered emergent. I'm, I, I'm calling them emergent, but they may not necessarily be emergent anymore. Um, they, they didn't exist when I started working on them, but uh, we're, we're into a decade or so of, of some of these threats. And so um, depending upon how you define emergent, um, we can see whether you can determine whether emergent or not. But uh, these, threats do relate to the overwintering strategies of each of these um, bat species. So we have wind energy development, which is affecting migratory species. And then we have white nose syndrome, uh, which is affecting bats that hibernate. And so unfortunately, depending or regardless of how uh, the bat chooses to, um, to combat winter, uh, there is a, um, a threat that's affecting them. 
So I do want to talk a little bit about each of these threats um, in a little more detail, um, and then we will move forward to what we're doing about that. So uh, wind energy development, um, it's, it's a great development. It's moving things forward the way we want to see it move forward, but it's killing bats, um, and there's no denying that. And uh, it is one of these effects that um, uh, may not be on everybody's radar, um, but it, 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 is a, um, is, it is a significant um, threat to bats and certain species of bats in particular. Uh, if we look at Colorado, um, and this is a, a wind energy development potential map, um, and it's basically a, a map that displays the uh, annual average wind speed. And so if we have these cooler purple or colors on the Eastern Plains, um, this is where our high, uh, high degrees of wind um, are consistently blowing uh, throughout the year. Um, then we also have the Continental Divide, uh, which is a little bit more logistically challenging to put up um, wind energy turbines. And so there's probably not gonna be a lot of wind energy development there, um, but on the Eastern Plains, um, there is significant potential for harnessing wind energy for development, as well as, um, you know, when you're driving north on I-25 and you all of a sudden hit the Wyoming border and man, the wind just kicks up. It's not just because you're going into Wyoming. There's some legitimate uh, things going on here where we've got wind, um, higher winds as just right at the Wyoming border. And so this is uh, primarily where these impacts are going to show, show themselves um, within Colorado. Uh, it's primarily out on the Eastern Plains. As far as the species of bats that are being affected, um, migratory tree bats um, is a group of bats within, the, um, within Chiroptera that are uh, being affected disproportionately um, by wind energy development. And within, within Colorado, we have three of these uh, species. We have the hoary bat, eastern red bat, and the silver-haired bat. And the eastern red bat is uh, distributed uh, across the Eastern Plains and it's making its way toward the Front Range. Um, and, but it, it does have spotty records across the Eastern Plains. And so there's not a lot, there aren't a lot of Eastern red bat records, uh, but they are definitely present within the state. The hoary bat and silver haired bat um, both occur pretty much statewide. And so they're, they're, found, um, they're found all over the state. But when we say bats are being uh, disproportionately affected, um, that means uh, if we look at the species that are present at a um, potential uh, wind turbine site prior to construction um, and figure out the bats that are present there, uh, as we look at post-construction surveys and what kinds of bats are being um, killed by the wind turbines, these bats are showing up in much higher percentages than any other species. Um, and there's evidence that they're being attracted to these wind turbines at different times. Um, and so these three species, which it's one thing to have a hundred birds uh, killed by a wind farm at, at some location, um, but those, those, uh, those mortalities are likely gonna be distributed across many different species. Um, when you look at bats, we're only looking at these three species that are really being heavily affected and that, that is causing uh, very detrimental effects for these uh, species in particular. So we look at, if we look at some of the literature, uh, recent literature, um, the bats are being killed in very uh, high numbers. And this is in the hundreds of thousands per year, depending upon the estimates and um, um, how how much you believe those estimates, but uh, there, there's no denying that a large number of bats are being killed at wind turbines each year. And um, so much so that um, this migratory bat that they're referring to here is the, the hoary bat, um, where it's, mag it's the fatalities that are occurring at these wind turbines may, um, may be affecting um, the population viability of that species. Recent work has also shown that um, 
the pre-construction surveys uh, or the type of clearance surveys that might go into place prior to uh, working on um, a wind energy uh, plant is that the the pre-construction surveys just aren't aren't cutting it. They are not uh, they are not predicting bat fatalities in the same way that if you were to go in and do a bird ser survey or go in and do a small mammal survey or go in and do a plant survey or any other uh, terrestrial species, uh, doing those surveys as to you know what's present before uh, and then what's present after uh, construction um, that model uh, does not work uh, with bats because of the attraction of these bats to um, these different wind turbines. So the, so the bottom line on this is we have migratory species, three species within the state, um, and they're being affected heavily by um, uh, wind energy development um, and wind turbines. The next uh, is uh, um, white nose syndrome. And this is another emergent threat where um, bats were discovered in uh, New York that were um, during a standard hibernation survey, uh, large numbers of bats were seen dead outside of the cave as well as within the cave. And they figured something, something's going on here. This is a problem. Um, and as this has progressed, um, some of these sites are showing 80% mortality. And these are very large, typically very large hibernation locations. And so if there are 10,000 individuals at this hibernation site uh, that's being monitored every year, it's consistently visited um, to see how many bats are present and you have 80% mortality at that site, uh, you now have 8,000 dead bats at a site where you had 10,000 bats roosting prior. And then there are only 2,000 bats left. Um, and so as the years progress, you can see that this has very detrimental effects to the populations of these species. Um, it is caused by an introduced fungus. Um, and it's, again, it was first seen in these large hibernacula. So white nose syndrome uh, was um, caused, it is caused by a, a fungus, uh, Pseudogymnoascus destructans. Um, it's the causative agent of white nose. It was first described in 2008, uh, but it was reclassified in 2013. So this was a species that was new to science um, and was described, thought to be in one genus initially, and it was reclassified um, and shown to be in a a different genus uh, in 2013. And so it is a pretty remarkable um, uh, advancement of science as you see uh, moving from seeing this very large catastrophic event at certain hibernation sites to then figuring out what was causing it, figuring out it was a, figuring out it was a fungus and then classifying that fungus, seeing how that fungus um, uh, kills the bats, um, and then moving on to see what we can potentially do about that. Uh, this fungus was introduced from Europe. It's shown to be closely related to um, other species within Europe. Um, and then um, an important factor, which was not known initially, was that some bats can be found with the fungus, um, but white nose syndrome isn't necessarily confirmed within that group of bats or within that species. And so that's, that's where we can have white nose positive, I'm sorry, uh, PD positive um, uh, accounts of bats where they're swabbed or some sort of sample is taken where we can find the fungus present, but the presence of the disease has not been documented um, at these locations. And so this is uh, where different species have shown that they've carried the fungus, but haven't necessarily shown white nose syndrome. Um, and this is a map of um, white nose syndrome movement across the, uh, the continental United States um, and Canada. And within um, New York here, uh, this is where the site was first found. Um, and then as these colors go from cooler to warmer, um, you can see how the fungus progressed 
west um, in a pretty standardized expected way, um, basically through bat to bat transmission as it moves across the state or across the country. However, um, in Washington, uh, in King County, uh, this would have been in 2015, 2016, there was uh, an occurrence that popped up uh, in that county. And so somehow um, a bat probably did not fly uh, from Illinois to uh, Washington and uh, was positive at the time, but in some way um, human transmitted most likely uh, this fungus was brought from the Eastern United States to, uh, to the Western United States. And so it, it, it did make that jump. Um, it was a pretty um, surprising um, find at the time. Uh, uh, hikers had found a dead bat on a trail and they said, well, we can submit it for white nose, but we'll see, you know, the likelihood of that coming back positive is pretty low, but it sure enough, it did. And then as they found um, other um, other samples uh, over time, they have found uh, more, more white nose positive uh, individuals. Uh, you'll notice that within Colorado, uh, we do not have um, any uh, either PD suspect or anything where uh, we have a clear bill of health. Um, we do feel like realistically, it's a matter of time uh, before, before it does show up in the state. Uh, the closest location right now is in um, is in south, southeastern Wyoming, uh, which is pretty close to the Colorado border, and um, uh, we will see. We have we are doing sampling every year, um, uh, both of uh, bats as we swab them, uh, as well as doing guano sampling, which can uh, indicate the presence of um, white nose in a colony. However, that brings us to the Western dilemma that I'm calling, I don't know. Uh, it was uh, just a, a, an issue that we have. Um, hey, Jeremy. Especially, yeah. Before you lead into the Western, can I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned it, when, when PD and white nose were in full force, it was really easy to diagnose the decline but you mentioned first about wind energy and the population declines that are expected. Can you explain to the audience why it's been so challenging to understand what wind energy impacts have meant for those populations? Yeah, the difficulty with wind energy is, um, you know, in, in the surveys that are done is that most of the work is clearance work to get the construction done for the wind energy development, but there's very, very little um, post-construction surveys that are done. Um, and there's very little that are done where the data are shared uh, amongst, um, amongst researchers. And so there, it's proprietary information on private land. Um, and there's, uh, the, for the surveys that are done, and so it's very, um, that data are very limited in their distribution of how, um, how bats are doing at these sites after their construction. So that is, that's the primary uh, concern with wind energy, uh, in my estimation, is that we're, we're not doing enough um, post-construction surveys on, uh, on these different locations. And even where we do have access, we're looking for parts of bats typically. That, sure, can, yeah. that can be scavenged, they're small, and just difficult to detect. Yep. Yeah, so, um, it, with white nose um, in the eastern United States, if you can envision the the the, um, the survey protocol, uh, basically is there's these large hibernation locations that have known been known about for years, um, and part of systematic surveying for the state agencies uh, was to go into these uh, caves and do counts. Um, however difficult that might be um, to do counts at this scale. Um, that was part of what they were what they were doing, and so when you have a cave such as this, uh, which is uh, gray ba gray bats, um, when you have eighty percent mortality at a site like this, um, you don't 
you don't need statistics to say that something's wrong. Um, there's obviously a problem um, when there's that many bats uh, dead on the ground. And this is where a lot of the roost monitoring um, and hibernation monitoring has been taking place and a lot of how these estimations are occurring. Um, in the Eastern United States, that's true. Um, in the Western United States, this is how we find most hibernation um, bats hibernating in caves and mines. Um, a lone individual, often a Townsend's bigger bat, um, that we would find in a cave or a mine. And so if we look at what we know within Colorado, um, this is the only data hey, Jeremy, slide. you just went on mute, buddy. Mute. Try and speak now. Try and yeah. speak now. I'm still there. You can hear, you can hear me. I can hear you. Can people, other people hear me? Hmm. I said, everybody else can hear you. I just, I just can't. So go ahead and proceed. Okay. Maybe it's those earphones. That's the problem. Is it? But, uh, so this is the uh, only data slide I've got. Um, but hmm. it looks at, um, the known hibernation locations uh, within the state, or within caves and mines, um, and there are, from the number of individuals found or counted at the site. And so if there's one individual counted at the site, um, this is the number of hibernation locations we've had at that site. And so you can see, yeah, one individual, there's a lot of them. Two to 10 individuals, there's a fair number of them as well. But once we get above 10 individuals, um, for Townsend's Bigger Bat, we know of seven uh, caves and mines. Uh, anywhere from 100 to 500, we know of one. Uh, and 500 plus, we know of one other, in, one other location that has that number of individuals. If we're looking at myotis, which is, this is seven species of, the, we're talking about seven different species within Colorado. Um, and if you're doing a cave or mine survey, and you're not handling the bats or just seeing them, you're just seeing them roosting, it's difficult to be able to tell what species they are. So they're often reported as just a myotis spa um, and not necessarily knowing what species it is, but you can figure out what genus it is. Um, that's where we have 30 individual, you know, 30 sites and then 57 individuals. But again, if we get more than 10 individuals, we have three three known locations. And these are caves and mines, um, again. Um, and this is all taken from data um, that was in a recent compilation of hibernation locations in the West uh, by Weller et al. And so um, if you look at that, and you if you're trying to find a site that has more than 10 individual bats, we've got 12 sites across the whole state over multiple species of uh, hibernating individuals. And so that's just not enough. That is not enough. That's not enough samples. That's not enough locations to go and be able to evaluate if white nose is um, impacting these species at these locations. For some species, we don't, we don't have any. We have zero no, low, known hibernation locations, zero. Like we don't know where they're at. And especially if we have more than, looking for more than 10 individuals. And so that makes it very difficult to determine whether or not uh, white nose syndrome is affecting bats within the state. So what can we do? Um, if we can't count them in the winter, um, we can look at them in the summer. So we still can look at population levels of bats in the summer. So it, you know, if bats are being affected in the winter and dying in the winter, um, they are very long lived. Um, so we can look at populations over time and looking at their populations over summer, even though we may not be able to confirm that it's white nose that's affecting um, these bat species, we can also see if their summer populations are being affected. So we do that by acoustic, acoustic monitoring of foraging sites, um, summer maternity site monitoring, so locations where uh, females will go to uh, rear and raise their pups. Um, as well as general roost searching uh, throughout, the, um, throughout the state. And then we're also just doing some general investigations of bat, bat ecology. Bats um, 
before these two threats, bats were still very um, mysterious and they're cryptic and difficult to study. Um, so there's not a lot of information known, it just in basic general bat ecology about how um, uh, bats go about their day or their night. Um, and so uh, if we look at closer at some of CNHP's work, um, here's what we're doing. Okay, uh, so acoustic monitoring. So we're able to take advantage of the fact that bats echolocate um, and record their vocalizations uh, or their echolocations um, and uh, determine species that are present in an area. Uh, this is done at uh, multiple scales. And so we can look at foraging areas um, where bats might be uh, flying around as this one uh, is in Rocky Mountain National Park. And so if a bat's flying around foraging in that, in that area, this is where uh, we would be able to determine that bats are present. Um, we can also set these up outside of roosts um, to some extent and monitor roosts that way. Um, it's not the ideal, but it is a, um, a less impactful and um, relatively easier way to, to e evaluate roosts. Uh, issue is you can't get at numbers, uh, you can only get at species presence. And so when we're talking about roosts, we really want to know numbers um, at these roost sites. And we can also evaluate different treatment areas uh, for things like um, forest treatments that might be occurring. Um, one of the large um, projects that we're involved in uh, at CNHP for Colorado um, is called the North American Bat Monitoring Program. Uh, and this is an initiative out of the USGS uh, that is um, attempting to uh, monitor bats across the continent um, on a, a you know a very large scale. And so the entire continent of North America has been divided up into a grid of 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer cells, um, and we're able to uh, break those up into different states and different regions and different. Um, forests and different national parks. Um, and it's a um, spatially balanced sampling and so that we can use both uh, this uh, top down and bottom up solution to, uh, to monitoring bats over time. Uh, within uh, CNHP, in coordination with Colorado Parks and, and Wildlife, we, um, we coordinate the uh, NA bat effort within Colorado. Uh, we're also doing um, work related to NABAT on National Park Service lands uh, in Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, the BLM has also done uh, some uh, NABAT work uh, and we, they will help set out the detectors and we'll analyze some of the acoustic uh, data. Uh, and this is being done in the Royal Gorge resource area presently, uh, but that might expand to the rest of the state as well. Um, and then with the Forest Service, we're helping with planning and acoustic analysis as well. Uh, we also are also involved in a um, National Park Service, um, uh, for lack of a better term, a hub to help uh, facilitate back bat monitoring at different park units um, across the country. And then we're also in uh, talks or discussions about uh, establishing a Rocky Mountain Cooperative with um, Wyoming and Utah to develop a more of a regional uh, approach to, to NABAT. So again, NABAT, uh, that's the one slide for NABAT. Uh, it's not just acoustic monitoring. It does have a lot more involved um, and it's a, it's a large program, but uh, we're pretty heavily involved with that here in Colorado. Um, and uh, we could spend a lot more time on that. But before, you, before you leave that slide, Jeremy, yeah, you sure. mentioned it's spatially balanced. Can you explain the clustering of like those yellow, those yellow squares in the middle? Yeah, so if you yeah, if you're looking at this map of Colorado um, on the on the screen, uh, that clustering of yellow is this uh, Royal Gorge resource area within the BLM, and so the BLM has um, is I think the Royal Gorge resource area is actually almost all the Eastern Plains, but there's there's this is where the BLM land is actually concentrated west of, or east of the Continental Divide, and so. Uh, this is their spatially balanced sample within the 
a resource area that they are um, uh, responsible for. And so that's that's what that yellow is. Um, there, there you would, this is an older map, but you would see some clusters as well, uh, like up near Rocky Mountain National Park and that kind of thing as well, if there was a more current map. So in addition to acoustic monitoring, we also do uh, maternity site monitoring, uh, as we mentioned, and there are different ways to do this. Um, one of which is a uh, mark recite uh, recapture. Uh, we can also do video counts. Um, this is a picture, a thermal image of a, of a mine um, uh, in Western Colorado, where we are uh, monitoring Thompson's big eared bats there. And you can see the heat signature of the bat are coming out of the mine. Um, and this is a this square thing you're looking at as a pit tag reader. So we've put uh, passive integrated transponders into these bats, and as they, this is the only entrance in and out of the mine. Um, and so as these bats are flying in and out, we're able to get um, uh, presence of and movements and activity of these of these pit tag bats. Uh, but we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second here. Um, and then also at these summer maternity sites, we're doing um, uh, PD, uh, the pseudogymnoascus destructans, the, the white nose syndrome fungus swabbing at the maternity site, which again, isn't necessarily ideal um, because the prevalence of the fungus uh, decreases over time into the sump in, as the summer progresses. But um, we are still able to find the presence of um, the fungus even into the summer. And then uh, we can also do that uh, by looking at uh, guano samples as well um, uh, for white nose presence or PD presence. Um, this is another example of a, a maternity site monitoring that we're doing in the Yampa Valley near Steamboat. Um, and this is one I'm working on with Rob. And uh, we have monitored two different um, buildings in in the Yampa Valley, uh, one of which is a, a large barn, um, and this is a an old house that's no longer occupied. Um, but we can catch the bats coming out of the the corner here, um, and this is primarily where they're exiting. Um, and this is using a harp trap. And then we will uh, also use pit tag uh, technology in this one, uh, where we're uh, injecting um, little RFID tags uh, into the bats. Um, and instead of a big square um, rectangle like we had at the last location, this is a antenna um, that is doing the same thing. It's reading the bats as they go in and out. Um, but this antenna that goes up along the wall is also run along the roof here. Um, and this, this back location where you see all the guano staining going on here, um, and this is where the bats are primarily coming in and out. So again, we're able to find um, basically daily movements of these bats over time. So we're able to hook these up to solar panels and run them uh, continuously. Uh, so once the bats are marked, we're able to um, get uh, daily activities as well as seasonal activities of when they return to the roost um, and maybe uh, leave for the roost from, from the roost for a little while and go who knows where, but then come back a week later um, and those, those sorts of movements are what we're interested in and, and evaluating. Um, another site uh, in, in uh, the White River that I mentioned before on the White River National Forest is looking at Townsend's big-eared bat. Um, and this is that same uh, photo uh, or that same mine entrance that was looked at um, from the thermal imaging prior. But this is what it looks like in the daytime. Um, and we'll do the same thing, use a harp trap and catch them as they're exiting. Um, and we can get uh, movements um, in and out. Uh, another interesting part about this project was that there's, this is the largest, um, this is the largest maternity site for this species known within Colorado. But 48 kilometers away, there's also a very large um, hibernation location. And so we wanted to figure out if this um, uh, movement is occurring between these two sites. So are there large 
movements of all the individuals um, from one maternity site to the hibernation location. Uh, if we have these very large, um, and by very large, I mean about, uh, I think we had about a thousand individuals um, counted at the maternity site. Um, and at the hibernation location, it's about five to 600 individuals um, when we do those counts. And so it was, we were curious to know, are they, are they moving as a big group um, or how many can we actually find um, at, these, at, these, uh, at this one hibernation location? Well, um, we did find movement. It was fun to, to go and scan individuals that you know you pit tagged um, five summers ago uh, at this maternity site and then go show up at the uh, hibernation location a, a long distance away. However, we have a total of about 30 individuals that we've, we've contact or that we've encountered over multiple times. Um, and so that, that isn't a, uh, that doesn't say that no, these bats are not all moving there, but because we can't, we're, we don't really, we scan most of the bats uh, in the hibernation location, but it, it is a difficult thing to do. Um, I might have a photo of it later, but it's, it's you know, putting these readers on a painter's pole and putting them, you know, 60, 60 70 feet in the air uh, trying to scan bats. And so uh, we we do our best to get scan all of them, but uh, we don't necessarily uh, can't can't say we've scanned them 100 um, percent. But we feel we do have pretty good coverage, but we did have interesting movement from um, from this site to the biggest hibernation location we know. But a lot of these bats are likely going somewhere else. We just don't know where that is. Um, and it may not be a cave. It may not be a mine. Um, this Townsend Big Eared Bat is expected to be a, a cave or mine obligate um, and found basically only in caves and mines. But that may not necessarily be true for the species as well. Uh, they may be using rock crevices um, as we're finding that a lot of these other species are as well. So if we're trying to figure out where these bats are moving from their summer locations to their winter locations, um, telemetry is one of the ways we do that. Um, telemetering and following bats around um, is very difficult. Uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not an easy task. Uh, if you can think, oh yeah, we put, like a, we put a car battery around an elk and we can follow that thing around for, for years because it has a big enough uh, battery to maintain the signal. Well, this is, um, I think this might be Rob, putting on a telemetry, a, a telemeter onto a bat. Um, and it's about this big. And if we're lucky, we get two weeks out of that, uh, out of that um, telemeter, telemeter before the battery dies. Um, Technology is getting a little better. So it might get a little bit, it might be a little bit longer these days, but, but not much. Um, and so you have a very limited amount of time where you can find out where these bats are located. And then they also like to crawl in very tight, uh, deep uh, cracks, um, which is not great for a radio signal to try to find. And so um, the attenuation and, and uh, the disturbance that the, just the locations of where these bats are, are located makes it difficult. Um, and so even when doing flights um, or even doing um, a lot of driving around, if there are roads there, um, it, it's, it is difficult to find where these bats are located. So a lot of times it's, we'll put a telemeter on and hopefully we see them again, but uh, um, the chances of that are, are sometimes pretty small. Um, so we have done that uh, previously uh, with, pallid bats uh, in southeastern Colorado. Um, and then uh, Rob also headed up a, a group of students that were working on um, looking at alternative summer roosts in the Yampa Valley. And so this was during the summertime at those same maternity site locations. They weren't, that bats aren't necessarily coming back there every night. And so trying to figure out where some of these other uh, roost sites are within the valley uh, was of interest. Uh, so in addition to um, marker capture work and telemetry, we also just do good old fashioned looking for bats and roost sites. And so this is 
um, abandoned mines. There are thousands of abandoned mines across Colorado's landscape that are being closed as a public safety um, issue. And we work with Colorado Division of Reclamation and Mining Safety and the Forest Service um, to conduct surveys in these locations. We also do cave surveys. Um, most of this work has been done with the White River National Forest, where there's a large concentration of caves. Um, and we'll do those in the winter as well as, um, as well as in the summer. And this is, here's an example. This is in that hibernation location I was talking about before. And this is me trying to knock off a group of bats that are roosting while uh, trying to scan them. Um, uh, but these are, this is the hibernation location where uh, we had pit tagged bats from the maternity site. And you meant to say you're trying not to knock them off. Yes, I'm trying not to knock them off. Yes, that's a very good point. Um, we haven't done that yet. Haven't done, haven't had one, haven't had one yet. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, oh, look at that. The picture didn't show up. It's on my screen, not on your screen. There's a great picture of Sarah climbing on here, but uh, it's not on your screen. So you'll just have to envision a person climbing here, um, looking for bats. But another, um, another initiative is for roost searching specifically is as climbers for bat conservation. And so we've said that bats are using um, things besides mines and caves. And one of the things that we're finding is that they're using rock crevices. So who better to find bats in rock crevices than climbers who are out there uh, recreationally climbing so we can provide information about where bats are being found um, and this is something that's been um, done across the um, across the world really we're get, uh, getting records from all over the world where different climbers are finding bats as they are climbing and this information can then be used to um, uh, provide better guidance on um, climbing management as well as um, just knowing where bats are at Oh, look, there's Sarah. See, I knew that picture was there. Yeah, it's a great picture. Okay. Um, furthermore, besides, uh, besides looking for roosts and white nose, um, we are still doing biological in inventories. So finding out what species are present on what properties, um, looking at occupancy projects related to fire and forest treatments, um, and then also continuing to be interested in movement between maternity sites and trying to figure out where these things are hibernating. Um, so we can uh, monitor them throughout all uh, seasons of their uh, life cycle. Um, another recent uh, uh, bit of information that we got out uh, as we're looking at some of these bat ecology investigations is looking at swarming sites. Um, and this is where we uh, affix glow tags to the back of bats. Um, so we had a little had a little bat rave uh, where they could uh, fly around between different uh, swarming sites in this canyon where we knew we had different caves and they were we would position people at these different caves and see what colors uh, you could see. We had different color tags. Um, and to see if we were having the same species show up at um, at the same locations or if they were working amongst different caves. Um, and then we also had, this is a pretty rare photo of bats copulating, um, which uh, is not seen very often uh, in the wild. Um, but yeah, we did find that there was a lot of bat to bat interactions and this is both between species and within species. Um, and so a lot of different interaction and potential for um, moving uh, white nose uh, uh, fungus around. So where do we want to go in the future? Um, again, we want to look at some more uh, wind farm uh, post-construction monitoring. Uh, we're going to be doing continued mark recapture, recite work at white and white nose surveillance at these maternity sites, uh, both um, within the Yampa Valley as well as expanding to to other sites across the across the state and potentially region. Um, we want to look at status assessments of a post white nose populations. We're not naive enough to think that Colorado is going to be completely shielded from white lows for too long. And so we do need to be ready for how are we going to assess um, population levels post in a post white nose uh, situation. 
I'm still looking to try to get a state and regional occupancy estimations uh, through acoustic analysis, um, and that's primarily going to be done through the NABAT program. And then this will help refine uh, statewide distributions um, as well as range maps. Amongst other things, uh, so we would there's a lot of uh, a lot of work to be done, um, and we're excited to be moving forward with it. So that's what I have. If you have any questions, fire them off, uh, or you can email me as well if uh, there's something you don't want to share in the chat. So as, as Jeremy let in, shoot questions either through the Q&A or through the chat. I've already got one in the queue for you. Sam Cook had asked when we talked about this, and I want this to lead into your first bullet for the direction you think CHP is going to go. And Sam asked, what is suggested for pre-construction surveys at wind, at wind facilities for bats? And, and it's, it sounds like, as you mentioned, that that kind of surveying really isn't cutting at least our expectations of assessing risk and tie that into how you think CHP should be involved in that. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it, it may depend on whether, I mean, I, I do, I still think that the site needs to be evaluated for bats. I'm not saying that um, they shouldn't ever be looked at. Um, it, so if there are large concentrations of bats there prior to the thing, to the construction, then yeah, definitely you're going to want to, to do surveys there as well. If there's water sources near the, um, near the uh, projected site, um, if there are roof sites or um, caves or mines or uh, cliff faces, you know, if these kinds of things on the landscape are present, those, are, those need to be evaluated for um, the presence of bats. Um, I, and I, and I, so I would say that, you know, if, if, because that's basically how we survey for bats to, to find out if they're present, uh, we need, we need to, we need to do those sorts of things. However, it's, it can't be the only thing that's done. Um, it, there has to be evaluation after the construction and then also potentially um, figuring out ways to deter bats um, from using that site. Uh, and there, are, there is work being done on that. We, we haven't done a lot of that work, but um, figuring out how to keep bats away um, through acoustic deterrence or other such mechanisms, um, as well as um, still just doing the, the post-construction surveys. So it sounds like it's, it's multi-pronged. Some, some acoustics just to understand what could be using the area and then identifying roost or habitat features that you think are would be utilized by bats to kind of selectively prioritize how we want to survey a site? Yeah, I mean, if you have a, say you have a playa or a, a, um, a wetland out in the Eastern Plains that's only wet during certain portions of the year, um, but they're bringing in a bunch of bats uh, during when they are wet, um, that's going to be a problem um, for uh, having a wind turbine right next to it. If you have any other seasonal um, fluctuations in water or, um, anything like that, then that could potentially um, create issues as well. All right, can I take you on a different uh, uh, journey here with a question from one of our alum? This is from Savannah Smith. Is there technology available to help with the data processing of the mine video counts to make it more automated? Uh, yes and no. Um, it, 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 there is. Um, we haven't employed that very much because as that, you, we, you saw that picture that was this nice square, right? And you think, oh, a bat leaves and a bat comes out. And, but there's also a lot of swarming and movement that goes around. And so it's not just one bat moving from one location. And it's also, they'll, they'll go in, they'll go out. They'll go in, they'll go out. I don't know what they're doing, but they're going in and out a bunch of times before they decide to go out and um, forage. And so it, it really does take um, some visual um, analysis, to, I think, at this point uh, to do it well. Um, there's people out there working on it for sure. And there are other sites out there where it's more conducive to AI um, or those automated technologies to try to figure out and do counts 
well, where maybe it's bats are going by one location that it's easier to count. Yeah, those technologies are, are being produced in areas where we have large exits, like at some of the caves in Texas, where you have predominantly an exit happening. But Jeremy's right, is sometimes this, this almost swarming and moving of in and out can be troubling for identifying exactly which individuals are which. So I've got you a question here that's probably one of the ones that we get asked the most. So what are your thoughts? This is from Stephanie Blakoviak, and I'm sorry, Stephanie, if I mispronounce your last name. What are your thoughts on the use of bat boxes on houses, tall posts, or on bridges over rivers? Show us how to install a bat box properly, yeah, Jeremy. Exactly. I like bat boxes are great, um, but they're not bird boxes, uh, and they're they're not occupied quite as frequently as you might have for say a bluebird a bluebird box or something like that. Um, the, the case in point is we'll put up a bat box um, and you know people say, well, if I put up a bat box, will they leave my attic and no longer go in the bat box uh, or no longer be in my attic and they'll just go to the bat box and that'll be the end of it and I won't have to worry about excluding them. And nine, and not even, 99, 999 times out of a thousand, those bats are not just gonna move um, to the bat box because they, they like that warm attic. Um, and so, Leaving them up for a long period of time helps, I think. Um, let them get weathered, let them get uh, different smells, um, let the bats start to investigate it a little bit. Um, I think, you know, Bat Conservation International has some, some pretty good guidance uh, and, uh, on how to uh, install a bat house and how to um, get bats to be, to use it. Um, but, it's it's not a it's not really if you are going to exclude them and exclude them in different ways and then putting up a bat box um, that they may go in there uh, and use the bat box after they've been excluded because this is a, a good second option um, if they can't if they can't try to get back into the attic but but I think um, I think bat boxes are useful um, for sure um, and they're they're pretty good. Um, you know, citizen science and like public display type uh, situations as well. And, and that information is really our knowledge about how bats are using these features is constantly changing to, to the point where it's been prioritized as a conservation need to understand how bats are using these um, art basically artificial roosts that are now sometimes readily available. And things like what are called bullet boxes where there's a box surrounding a post all the way around starting to illuminate that just having a static one size fits all in one direction will be the, the thing that bats will need. Doesn't seem to fit. Bats seasonal, daily, uh, sex specific, age specific needs change throughout the year. And so having some larger um, uh, facility that can accommodate different temperatures and what bats might need may be more of a priority than some of the smaller boxes that we've created in the past. Yeah. And they're going to move, you know, they're going to move seasonally and even within within the box within a day. Um, it's it's like your cat trying to find the sunbeam uh, sunbeam in your house. It's going to keep moving until it finds that sunbeam because um, that's where it wants to be all the time. And so it's it's looking for op the bats are looking for optimal temperature both um, both seasonally as well as um, you know small movements during the day. So we've got a couple minutes left. I hate to hit you with this question at the last, but it's probably the one that I'm hit with as much as I'm hit with the question about bat boxes or rabies. And that's what should people keep in mind as the concern with things like COVID become more pronounced and what they think is an association with bats. Can you kind of elaborate on what the public should be thinking about? Yeah, and so the guide, you know, we, we weren't able to, this last summer, we weren't able to handle bats um, at all because of the fear of um, transmission of viruses back and forth between humans and bats. So we had the concern of, primarily with last year, the concern was present of humans transmitting COVID back to bats um, and then having some sort of reservoir created in bats that would then mutate and have a new a new strain of COVID that would then be somehow given back to humans that could potentially be um, even more uh, 
lethal. And so like those fears and concerns are, are real. And I think, I think COVID did have a pretty big um, influence on how we're gonna be doing bat work in the next 20 years or how we're gonna continue to do bat work. And um, that there's been some really interesting work um, that's either been illuminated or um, done uh, since COVID has started. But the, the movement of the common cold virus between humans and bats has, known to, has been shown to occur multiple times. And so if you think about that for a little bit, um, if, uh, if COVID didn't keep you up at night, that can, you can make you think about that a little bit. Like the, the, this virus is, has been shown to move between bats and humans, which don't interact very often, right? And there's not a lot of interaction between humans and bats, but this um, in different parts of the world that, that may not be as true. But there's this, this evolutionary movement between of, of the virus between humans and bats that has um, been shown to occur. And so that's just evidence that it can occur with, with pretty much all viruses. Well, with some clarification that we're not even sure that, that COVID-19 is directly from bats. The closest relative to that, that coronavirus is found in bats or so we believe, or even pangolins. But the thing I try and uh, reiterate is that it's this constant uh, pressure that creates spillover events when you're actually interacting directly with bats. So if you're eliminating habitat and you're becoming in contact with species you haven't before, bats are phenomenal carrying a host of viruses and surviving those viruses. So it's more often that we interact with them that we create these opportunities for spillover. Yeah. All right. Well, I've exceeded our, well, I've forced us to exceed our time. Jeremy, I really appreciate your time on this. Thanks everybody for attending. Um, join us again. We'll be back in a couple of weeks uh, talking about a big program for the Natural Heritage Program in providing data throughout Colorado, not just our data, but everybody's data in a project called uh, Codex. So thanks for joining us. Have a good uh, week and uh, see us again soon.